Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, it, it's given. Uh, I've been given the opportunity to introduce Mr. Puneet Singh. So, Mr. Puneet Singh is the Chief Operating Officer of Banking and Capital Markets at Genpac. He has been. He has spent close to two decades in Genpac, working across various functions such as strategic, sales, business development, transitions, operations, hiring, and quality. Uh, in his previous role, he was the growth leader for the Asia Pacific market and achieved two fifty million dollars of uh, profitable revenue and three hundred million dollars of booking revenue annually across service lines of digital consulting, transform transformation, and intelligent operations. As the CEO, as the COO at Genpac, he now manages twenty five thousand employees globally with the revenue of one billion dollars. He is also a certified Six Sigma. Black belt and holds a bachelor's degree in software engineering from the University of Melbourne, Australia. We are honored to have such an esteemed presence uh, among us, and are delighted that you took out your valuable time to share some of your insight and experience with us, students. Uh, a warm welcome, uh, Mr. Puneet. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. That's, that's a very impressive intro, Puneet. Um, I'm really excited to have you here. I know we've been trying to make this work for a couple of weeks and we finally found a slot in your busy schedule. And today we're gonna hear about your career journey, about industry trends in general, your take on that. And obviously what everybody's talking about right now is the impact of COVID on business, on Genpact itself. So if you don't mind, I have so many questions I, I want to get through. Um, we will go through the moderated session first with our questions, and then we'll open it to a Q&A at students. Um, so let me start. Um, what's your, you know, please give us a little bit about your life story, you know, how you started your career, some of the companies that you worked at, some of the roles that you took on. Um, so, uh, you know, generally your career path. Sure. So um, actually, uh, you know, the two decades uh, that was mentioned at Genpack is pretty much my career. Um, I'm kind of born, brought up in G Genpack, as I say. Um, after my engineering, I just did a year in HCL uh, and a couple of years in a startup, and that's pretty much it. Um, in, in summary, my career is uh, driven by, I think, my hunger to learn and my company's uh, goals at that point in time. And what I mean by that is uh, I never ran my career in terms of this is what I want to do in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I ran my career as I want to learn new things and I will do whatever my management asked me to do uh, because I think I'm fungible uh, across skill sets. So I started as a software engineer, very focused on improving uh, frameworks of what we call CMM level five for people who would know to hiring, to sales, to transition, to quality, to running operations. So it's pretty much industry is the expertise where you work in and uh, that's really the brief on the career. Okay. And um, as an executive, what would you say are the biggest challenges that you've had so far? Yeah, it, 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 for me personally, you know, when we, uh, uh, you know, when we were rising in the industry, the industry was rising, the company was rising. There was this uh, dominant theory on you have to be uh, focusing on a particular line of work expertise, and most of my peers were doing that. There was other dominant theory of the industry is booming, make you know shifts after every three four years, and you will make more bucks, I guess. Uh, you know, so. I'm a little bit of an outlier in my uh, vintage category because I think I did not go with any of those two theories. Uh, the, uh, so for me, it was a constant challenge to uh, question my choice of why am I not going with dominant theory where 80% of the population is going and why am I going to do something different? Uh, but I think I've now stopped doing that uh, because I think uh, it's very clear that uh, uh, how careers for those people have panned out versus me and uh, it, it works for me as well. So, you know, that's the only challenge I had. It was more to do with me personally uh, rather than anything else. So you're saying that versatility is is good. You you yeah. didn't you didn't keep a focus in your career, like just to do one thing. So I will just, you know, do a call out right now. You will find me very different from maybe your other speakers or other people from the industry because I think I'm a little disruptive in the way I think. Um, and let me answer your question by the first disruption. 
when i was growing up you know i was always told uh, uh don't be a jack of all right uh, focus on one and i always lived my career at least in fact my life where i think you have to be jack of all and king of few uh, you know so why you should focus on one or two things and for me that focus was really the industry but i wanted to be jack of all which basically meant i want to know how operations run how hiring runs how training runs how do people go to campus and get people uh, how do people uh, drive uh, more sales so i wanted to you know understand and learn everything from a curiosity perspective and hence i think uh, i went in the direction where i think versatility is important and uh, uh, expertise is also important it's just that uh, in the kind of industries we are uh, it it works if you know all parts of the life cycle basically especially for a coo who has his kind of hands in almost everything that the company does so th- i guess that's worked really well for you you're right in fact the reason that i got this role almost a uh, year or two back is just for those reasons that you know they said you have any ways done all the parts of the elephant do the elephant that's awesome so can you tell us i always ask some of you know some of our guests this question it's it's always interesting to me personally who would you say have been your mentors and what have you learned from he or she you could have more than one mentor you know what did you learn from that mentor yeah so i you know i will and maybe his girl may spend more time so um you know i from a professional perspective i got impacted by two people i think one is mr jack welsh who was ceo for general electric for many many years and uh, he he's one of the reason why i joined what we used to call the meatball or general electric ge at that time we were ge at that time and while again this is not what everybody should be doing but i'm not into reading books uh, i've never read a book uh, i just find reading articles and stuff more you know effective but i did take a passe at uh, jack welsh book, book called straight from the gut and basically what it said is business and career is all about relationships with people so irrespective of what you do what function you are do how good your relationship with your team and customers defines everything more than domain or expertise and that stuck on me uh, that is still very impressionable on me where i always believe in connecting with people and making relationships work so that was that uh, uh, you know uh, kind of a mentor if i could say the other person who i have more of a deeper mental relationship with the current ceo of genpact uh, tiger who's pretty much you know i always bounce with him what moves to do in terms of career and how to go about things and you know basic fundamentals of 80 20 and being focused and you know on till you get the person then move on to something else the other people i'm impressionable impressionable with is actually you know the, the and i've said this in genpact forums is is the women around me you know my uh, my mother my sister you know these guys have built independent careers uh, along with you know taking care of you know their uh, their, their homes um, and that always gives me a sense of balance you know that you have to live your life in a very balanced way whether it's work life balance within work how do you balance within life how do you balance uh, so those are the three broad answers to the question on you know who is going to be my mentor that's actually really nice because i remember the last person i interviewed and i asked her the same question and she said the same thing interestingly she you know she said it was her mother her sisters and she's now the head of hr at one of the big four and she said it was it was really her grandmother and her mother who believed who made her believe she could do it all and women i think are the biggest multitaskers and and can get very focused on on different different things so that that's really amazing and it's interesting you you say the same thing um that it's the women in your life that motiv- that motivate you yeah no absolutely that's accurate that's very nice so describe a typical day of yours i know you're super busy because to to get hold of you has been is 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 hard so i know that there probably are not enough hours in your day but what does a typical day look like so actually you know uh, uh, for me uh, so yeah i am very flexible uh, i am not a morning person but i am very flexible outside that and i have global teams so i like to uh, plan my week in advance uh, so that's the first thing i so i already know what i am supposed to do monday to friday this week uh, that helps because then i can put slots of 
whether it's a game of tennis for me which is an important event every four days in a week uh, or catching up with friends or uh, just spending time with, at home with kids and parents and family or about doing work stuff so you know i line up my um, day basically with calls and meetings across the world different day different this thing but i like to uh, keep it balanced for me you know every day is a unit of measurement to balance so i don't like if i am overworking a day i don't like if i am underworking a day uh, i would prefer to balance every day with enough time across so it's not a set routine is the short answer to your question because i want to be flexible to other people but yeah besides the morning i'm pretty flexible so i can you know start my day at 12 likewise work till midnight <laughs> Yeah, I'm I've always been the same as well. But do you think that because you're working from home that flexibility is a lot easier, right? Because are, are you, uh, is the employees at Genpact are they back in the office yet? Are you back in the office? So the employees uh, are mostly 95% plus still working from home because, you know, it's not really required for them to be in office. There is a 5% population in office because we didn't get approvals from regulatory reasons to do that work. but even in that case you know they're all safety norms and they're staggered and socially distanced and stuff like that as far as i'm concerned i've always been very flexible in my work i always believed in work from anywhere so even before covid i used to have days working from home days working from office days traveling uh, and actually i don't see much change in my uh, life because yes i am more days work from home but i also go to work you know once a week just to kind of go around so it hasn't impacted me personally much uh, except the travels not happening and that time has actually uh, been diverted towards i guess a little bit of work and a little bit of family so yeah. Yeah, that's no no we so we are exactly the same we have a partial office open on certain days and you just you know being in gurgaon i go the opposite way and i go into delhi and the amount of travel time i spend i realize that i could be working in those hours um and it's exactly the same i, I you know i I decided then not to go to the office because I felt like I was more productive at home and right. that almost 3 hours I would spend on the road going into South Delhi it was you know I'm not sure it was a productive use of my time and at least for the time being if you are able to work from home it it does it just does make sense um I want to move on to a little bit about business now um your career journey has been amazing it seems that you have it's really taken off um at genbat um what would you say are the emerging trends in the business and do you think that these trends have changed like from the beginning of the year pre covid to a post covid climate yes i think that's massive uh, i think the business world is changing this year and most of it is changing for good and you know call out says one is broadly every business whether it's a bank or a consumer good company or a healthcare bank or or you know whatever uh, they are challenging their own status quo their own operating model they're saying okay we ran things a certain way we now change it because now a is possible b is possible c is possible and it's very relevant in our industry because a lot of our customers still don't work with us they have their own in house teams because they think it's better uh, but now that everybody's working from home it doesn't matter whether that person is working from home for a bank or for genpai but it's pretty much the same thing uh, secondly i think uh, the bigger theme is around automation and disruption through digital technologies i mean uh, everybody is saying you know why can't i deploy digital here why do i need this process why do i need this process step why do we need to travel i mean that's all you know we are thinking i mean actually why do we need to travel for business i mean the business is getting conducted we are we are doing sales cycle deals we have within covid sold a large deal hired for the large deal put them into operations all in covid all remotely so i think uh, those two are the biggest uh, disruptions which are actually impacting our industry positively so so you would say that there are certain things about the whole covid situation that has been positive for genpact oh absolutely other, other, other than just the work environment for your employees and and do you think you will ever Do you think you will ever go back to that full the model of everybody being in the office five days a week every day? There's a lot of companies that like, you know, the cost of having everybody in a building. It's, you know, everybody's measuring that out. That the 
safety, but the fact that everybody is working probably twice as hard at home and the cost of the company are a lot less. So, you know, uh, assuming safety is guaranteed uh, and there is no safety differential. So our safety levels are same as pre-COVID. Then I think it will be an informed choice depending upon what the client wants us to do uh, for that process. Uh, I don't think cost will be really a reason because, you know, while there are advantages in retail space uh, avoidance, there are costs on technology size and, you know, whatever else. While there are, uh, and by the way, our, our employee morale uh, actually has been higher this year than previous years, uh, employee engagement. But, you know, again, it's an employee specific thing. Some people would like to go to office. Some people would like to stay at home. Some people would like a blend. So I think it'd be a combination of some of those events, but it will be primarily driven by what is the right thing for the customer that we should be doing. Uh, I was having a session, I think, uh, previous week, which uh, for clients where we open work from home or work from anywhere, it disrupts the industry in a very different way where we can now hire talent pretty much anywhere in the country or anywhere on the globe. And they can work on that process remotely, um, you know, without coming to a physical place. It just opens a different talent pool at a different cost. So I think a lot of those things will get analyzed and uh, assessed. Um, but yes, 100% won't be going back. 100% won't be sitting at home. Answer would lie somewhere in the middle, I guess, in the future years. Yeah, that's kind of the, the take I'm getting from a lot of people we're speaking to, that it will sort of be a hybrid model. Right. I think people are CEOs, COOs are feeling that it, it will never be the same. It will never probably go back to 100%, but there will be something because it makes it easier for women to work. It makes the whole commute easier. I mean, there's a lot of advantages, the impact on the environment, you name it. So from what I can gather after speaking to people is that there will be some, you know, it will be different. It will never go back to being the same, but there will be some sort of, like I said, hybrid model between the two. Absolutely. So I have a quote here for you. Never waste a crisis. Can you, can you give me some light, throw some light on this metaphor? Probably COVID being the crisis <laughs> or any other crisis you can think of. <laughs> no, actually, you know, this is, I mean, actually, I mean, I can't recollect any other crisis of this impact. And for me, interestingly, in my mind, I was already in a crisis because I signed up for a role which was a little alien for me. Uh, I, I did not... Uh, had the experience of running large-scale operations and I was just a couple of months into the role that COVID happened. So for me, it was, you know, baptism by fire completely. Uh, but, you know, what I realized and what a lot of us realized is, again, I'll go back to people, the power of people, um, you know, those days when we were trying to get employees enabled to work from home, uh, laptops, machines being shipped to people's homes, um, technology solutions being revamped for them to enable to work from home, uh, still regular work being happening, just brought that one quality in people, which we obviously, you know, celebrate as grit uh, or somebody mentioned resilience, right? I think we saw that power of grit and resilience, which basically means if you are aligned to a common goal, it's just crazy what one, what teams can do together. And I did not realize that uh, before this crisis. So for us, really the opportunity, and I say this, I say this, that if we could do all of that stuff in crisis, then in BAU, what we do normally is operations should be just a cakewalk. You know, we should be able to just, you know, go through those uh, delivery for the customer and right thing for them. Those should be just easy things for do compared to what we just did in the first three, four months of COVID. So for me, it's the power of people and, and grit and just align to a common goal. And are you seeing, I'm assuming you've still, uh, ha you've still had people onboarding during the COVID because it's almost been a year now. Are those new employees, are you seeing that same grit from them? Because they're, you know, joining a new organization in a COVID time, it, it's not an easy thing. Are you seeing grit in them too? Yeah, I think obviously there's a assimilation uh, challenge which because they are not touching and feeling anybody so they can't touch and feel the culture but I'm assuming they can still get it from the way we interact the way we behave and obviously the interactions through zoom have obviously helped because there's a lot of interactions happening I think they are demonstrating grit personally by just uh, signing up to a new normal because for them also to join a new company meet new people all remotely I think is a kind of a grit because it's not you know it's not normal it's not easy to 
start doing certain things like that and we have people doing that and they're happily then inducted and you know doing the doing their business so i think there is a clear uh great from that sort of employees as well that's awesome so the world, i think you've you've mentioned this a little bit the world is going through a huge demand for digitalization you did touch upon it um in light of this digitalization that is happening and it's increasing what in your opinion are the important hard skills that you could tell the students today to be armed with so you know here there is what i think and and you know i it's a little bit of a ironical question for me because i'm actually by graduation i'm a software engineer so i you know i i coded things i can program things i know what programming and digital means on the other side ge has taught me the power of process i'm a six sigma process black belt right and in a lot of setups these two things are uh, you know uh, different answers to the same question uh, and what i believe is in is the hybrid of those two so to answer your question the skill that still remains dominant is understanding the customer problem or understanding the problem you're trying to solve for from the customer perspective and hence you have to be a domain expert first so you have to understand how does a credit card get processed how does a you know an accounts payable invoice gets uh, you know issued if you understand that then you will know what are the areas you can improve in that process and you will also know where can you put technology so for me that core domain expertise and that core skill set of understanding a process um and improving it the sense of curiosity and improvement is still the dominant skill set um uh, yes on top of that you know digital technologies is the mantra um <laughs> of, uh, you know flavor of the year but i can tell you from my experience you know i won't be surprised if in 10 years later all this will go away because you will have just you know bots doing everything you won't even need program people to code i guess uh you know even that process will get automated in a way but what will stay is people who understand how it works how the process works like i say you know cinema halls can get eliminated uh, maybe you know retail stores can get eliminated what will not get eliminated is farmers farming their produce because no there's no you know replacement for that similarly here there's no replacement for the power of process and domain yeah no no that that makes sense you can't what i think what you're saying is you can't basically until you understand the customer problem that's always going to be important right for a comp- especially a company like genpat you always need to understand what the the customer issue is before you can even put a process in place but yet the process is also still important and i think that's that's important for students to realize because we teach them that a lot even in the interview process when you're going to an interview try and understand what does the company do what can you do to help their customers and that's something that i definitely just teach even in the soft skill training part of it and i'm so glad you're saying that because then it's coming from the horse's mouth <laughs> and that's what you're saying <laughs> problem solving yeah yeah exactly and and i think the adaptability and the flexibility you have today um to just go in and deep dive into the customer domain and 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 resolve the issues that they're having. Yeah. This is I thought it's an interesting question to ask a COO. You know, usually you judge and you measure hard work of your employees because you're physically there, right? Who comes first into the car park? Who leaves last? Who's there doing, you know, plugging in all the hours and everything. It's very easy to see, you know, who the high achievers are who the who are the people who are really trying because it's all very physical right people are you know you, you're seeing things but how do you measure all of this employees their um uh you know how how they are doing and and you know where they are going in their career path if it's a work from home model how have you been doing that this year so you know i'll i'll give you the two two answers one is i personally myself don't believe in what i call input metrics um you know so spending number of hours at work uh, doing transactions is an input metric i actually don't believe in it personally that's the way i've done my career so um and I, and i don't expect people to run it like that i believe in output metrics which basically means if you were supposed to you know do a do a task or achieve certain outcome for the company or the client has that been achieved or not uh you know it doesn't matter what input metrics went into it 
and because i personally believe in it so much um you know i actually don't ask any of my team that you know or they don't ask their teams you know how many hours did you put into work where have you been we had to do abcd things have they been done yes or no it aligns with also the culture that is you know in in genpack uh, you know as a as a gift from g is we've always been very metric scorecard driven and output scorecard metric driven so even at my level even at an agent level who does the basic transactions their their annual performances their bonuses are all driven by a very uh, structured scorecard goal sheet with metrics it's not ambiguous it's very black and white so it just depends upon you know outputs on those and the interesting thing in this model is whether you are physically in the office or whether you're working from home that scorecard doesn't change that metrics don't change uh, and they're still easily measurable so only thing uh, that doesn't happen is that input metric piece of it which is you're not seeing physically people are they actually you know zooming the video out and you know playing some board game with somebody on the side or are they sitting in the office but you know like i said it doesn't matter in fact i actually feel work from home will make employers and companies more empathetic to employees needs and letting them balance their lives unless and until the output is driven no that's that's very true very very true i was just writing a few notes while you said that because i thought that was quite it's quite a nice thing to hear a company and and a leader to say that that you know you're not concerned about what hours anybody's but it's it's really about working effectively isn't it you work in the morning you work in the night it's not about you're there 9 to 5 it's about the work you're getting done and the value you're adding to to a company yeah and i i can i know i speak to a lot of my peers and a lot of them their career has actually taken off this year you know the whole covid thing has ironically you know not going into the office their their uh, output has been very high and they've actually been promoted they you know the companies have seen their value which is quite a odd thing you know I, I, but there's been so many odd things that have come out of this pandemic so you know I, I, who knows who knows where this whole thing is you know going to end up but it's definitely made so many changes um in corporate culture and i've heard that a lot from leaders too and especially at a coo level where you have so much interaction with people your empathy is going to be so important to everybody That's you right. know yeah in fact the the i don't know if you guys see the wallpaper on my screen uh, the genpad got talent actually is a event that we just discovered in covid saying everybody is getting stressed with work from home let's do something fun and we just did one with my vertical which is let's just look at people's talent music singing art whatever and it was just like you know just mind boggling uh, talent and then we ran it globally uh, and we're in the process of some top 10 finalists and stuff like that you see so much talent from your employees through zoom globally which you won't see it in a in a conference room in in a gurgaon or in a manila or in a in a new york and it's just goose bumpy to see you know so much talent that people have outside work and they feel good about it which i don't think can be achieved in 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 you know it wasn't achieved in peak covid times for sure it's actually funny because i remember a few weeks ago uh go daddy what well, they did the same thing and i i was going walking past my husband's laptop i was like what what's going on there were people jumping they were i would say they had almost i think what was that what's that thing they had a flash dance they had a flash mob i was like are you working let's get this no 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 we've got a we've got a talent competition happening i don't think they ever took it global but definitely pan india they had it and it was really good fun yes it is, it is. Um, so it's like hmm, yeah I, and i've seen them do that too but uh, you know again they didn't take it globally but whatever they did in pan india was looked like it was a, it was a lot of fun and i guess that's how you also keep the motivation going for the employees you have to do these things just to uh you know just keep that motivation level up for everyone yeah like i would have never met families parents siblings kids or yeah. so many boys but i've met them twice a year twice already in this year so you know there's a lot of benefits so hopefully the answer lies in taking the benefits of pre covid and covid times and you know having a good nice hybrid uh even from an employee engagement perspective yeah yeah that that sounds great um So we've mentioned the fact that it's been a it's been a really strange year it's been a surreal year i mean 
it's funny that, that I think one of those memes that I keep seeing is that I don't think anybody predicted this five, where would you be in five years? It's such a standard HR question. I don't think anybody predicted that, you know, in the fifth year of their career or when they were about to graduate, there would be a pandemic. So how would you, how would you best advise students today who, and a lot of them are in the audience today about how to be relevant and do they need, you know, how to make perhaps reinvent themselves for this post-COVID world? At some point, this is going to die down and it'll be, you know, right now we're in a very present time with COVID, but post-COVID, how would you suggest, you know, the students reinvent and reevaluate their, their career growth? So, you know, for me, the answer to that question is no different, even if there wasn't any COVID. Uh, because I believe even if there was no COVID, the, the, the world's moving at such a fast pace, the needs are changing, customers are changing, paradigms are changing, that that one skill set everybody should have is to challenge the status quo, uh, be curious. And, you know, to certain people, it comes naturally. Uh, to certain people, that's the way they want, they, they live their careers. I think it will become more frequent now, which basically means in your, if you have A or B skill set, challenge it in terms of what will it get you or should you be doing something else in your choice of companies uh, in your choice of you know uh, areas of work challenge what you think is the status quo and just challenge it more frequently i mean challenge it every year um, you know i have a lot of students who come and say okay tell us talk to technology i should learn programming in and i tell them if i was you i won't do that being a programmer i'm telling you i won't do that i would go and invest in some soft skill that you lack, uh, some people engagement skill that you lack, or some domain skill that you lack. Um, so I think it's very important for students as they graduate and as they enter their careers, uh, join companies, uh, join areas of work that encourage such behavior, that encourage curiosity, uh, you know, that really in in encourage uh, people to learn and new, uh, do new things and try new things and not really put everybody in the same cast. Uh, you know, of mold. I think that's what my advice would be. We get the same, uh, we get uh, in the careers team, we get a lot of the same question, you know, what skills should we be learning? So usually it's R, Python, you know, it's machine learning, it's SQL, it's, it's those kind of courses. It really is. Um, we, we, you know, I've heard myself saying that as well, honestly. But my passion is soft, and I, and I exactly how you're saying the the whole soft soft skill training. And when it comes from you, it sounds different. But you know, I've always said this to my students. I I must say this every single time I meet them. I always believe that soft skill training was it was always important. And I think you're saying the same thing. It was never that you know, your communication skills were not important, the way you speak, your English, your grammar, that was always important. But post-COVID, it's become even more important. And I, and you know, I think students do tend to, and I've, like I said, I've heard myself say that, okay, go, go get this certification, go get that. Um, I do believe in the soft skills. I don't, I, I don't think I say often enough is to concentrate on your people skills, on your, you know, your verbal communication is so important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. So I'll give you another very specific answer to just the Python example, right? Uh, I did my undergrad in software engineering some 23 years back. Even, even then I realized it is not important to know what programming language you need to execute on. It's important to know the software life cycle. And I wish the market industry has more courses around making people understand what does software requirement process is? What's the software design process? The art is really in making the algorithm of the design based on customer requirements. It's translating your English requirements into a algorithmic design, which can then be executed into any program language. But unfortunately, nobody focuses around those two things. People are just focusing languages and the language will keep changing from you know basic DOS, COBOL, Fortran, C, Java, SQL to Python or whatever, they will change, but the fundamental process of requirement design will never change. And that's what is needed to understand and solve customer problem. And that's where the soft skills will come in place and the domain skills will come in place. So I think that's the other thing that people should understand what is permanent that you should you know learn yourself on and what is transitionary, which maybe you can give a skip. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be careful now when I, when I say go get that certification, go get that. I'll think twice. I, it, it's just, I think it's because everybody's using the same buzzwords. Yeah. Everybody's talking about data analytics and how important it is to companies. That's what companies are doing right now is analyzing all this data. But you're right, in 10 years time, it probably be bots doing all that, you know? So you have to keep that 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 flexibility in the fact to just keep evolving your career. So I, I go back to your first point. I think it's a good idea to be, you know, jack of all trades. Yep. I always believed in that, but uh, my husband completely disagreed. So you didn't master anything. I'm like, well, thank you very much. <laughs> but anyway, moving on. Um, I do I do have a couple of questions. So I will ask my last question at least. In relation to GenPad, do you think the traditional career growth is a thing of the past um, or will it still uh, exist post-COVID? Like say, you know, a graduate, you graduate, you get the top marks and then you go to the, so you go to the top school, then you go to the top uh, workplace and then you work your way up and you go. So do you think all that is still going to stay the same or do you think it will change? Well, actually, at least in some of the dominant industries, I don't see it changing. I mean, you know, I, I think in some of the dominant industries, uh, including ours, uh, that will still stay because business is coming, growth is happening. Uh, people need to grow, people need to, you know, uh, be staffed. Um, so, yeah, I don't think, I don't see that changing unless, yeah, I actually, do, I actually also think it's a little bit of a evolution of society kind of a discussion. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I was just thinking along those lines because, ge uh, you know, geographical boundaries are going to drop, right? The whole, it's not work from home anymore. It's work away from home. Whether I'm hiring a data analyst in, in Gurgaon working from home or he's sitting in London, it doesn't matter anymore, right? So, you know, I, I just feel companies are, uh, you know, are they looking for different things now, right? Because geographies are dropping, boundaries are dropping. Yeah. And people work, with, I guess leaders are looking for flexibility, adaptability, problem solvers, you know, yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, so I think that, that's it. So I, think, I think this will impact the resourcing uh, dynamics of it, but I don't think it will impact the career growth aspect of it. So it will impact the bottom of the pyramid, I guess, uh, in, any, in any operating structure, delivery structure, but it won't impact how you grow from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. Sure. Okay, I have a question. Um, students, please feel free now to start putting your questions um, in the chat. Um, this is from Anurban. He's saying, how do you think AI can change the current market trends in the banking and financial sector? So, I mean, this is already in play uh, and it's basically to eliminate certain parts of the process where we are actually putting people to do it, which is you know, the bots themselves uh, through AI will tell you, uh, you know, whether you're looking for a resolution on a credit card inquiry or something, the bot or the chat will already solve for eight out of 10 steps, which means you don't need eight out of 10 people. You just need the last two for exception. So uh, it's already in play for a lot of transactional processes where the decision tree is already there. And, you know, it's just somebody uh, answering uh, on behalf of the human by just you know preempting and answering in a through the AI this thing and then only the last two things that need an exceptional handling kind of comes in. So there are a lot of those such examples, you know, on all kind of banking operations. Sure, sure. Now I think the you know I think a lot of our students always have that question that you know you know we don't even know you know we're studying now but by the time we graduate what is going to be you know available out there in the workforce. So we get a lot of that and then who knows, you know, next time there could be an earth shattering, you know, environmental disaster. We just don't know. Um, I want to ask, ask this question. All right. So Utkarsh is asking, as we are going towards digitalization, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the survival of the human species in the long run is getting impacted as we are running towards a faster world. You must have noticed like the patient in a, the patience in a person for finding a result or completing the process has or completing the process has went has gone down because of technology doing things much more faster than the human mind so what would be the steps you will take to bring alignment 
in the use of technology and the health of employees in your company in the future? Wow. <laughs> okay. So I, I, you know, this is, you know, I, think, I think this is actually a good story for the human species. And when I say good stories, I'll relate to, you know, what my uni professor once said that, you know, understand your customer problem or what you're trying to solve for so good and then translate it into a design or algorithm that even monkeys can code. And I think that is still relevant because human beings will get evolved to do very higher uh, intellectual tasks. Uh, so rather than picking up the phone or punching stuff on the keyboard to do transactional stuff, you will not need human beings to do that. You will need human beings to design that algorithm that is actually interacting with the client, A, or you will need humans to then analyze all the data that's coming out of those technology interactions. So in both cases, the basic, what we call arms and legs work is getting replaced or eliminated, but getting replaced by a more higher intellectual, higher contextual kind of work, which will require people for both domain skills and analytic skills and decision making skills. So that's one answer to the question. The other answer was about the speed. Um, I actually, you know, it depends upon the area of work, but you know, in certain cases, human beings are still a faster resolution uh, than a technology. And I'll give you, you know, in life, personal example, you know, you can switch on 20 things in your home when you're coming from your, you know, way in from your airport by enabling 20 clicks on your mobile. Or if you have a luxury of somebody at home and you can just tell them, Bhaiya, main aara which basically means that, you know, I'm coming and then everything else will be turned on. So the point I'm trying to make is answer doesn't lie in technology always. It lies in a good hybrid to solve for the time angle, the speed angle. Um, it's the end experience that's important from, an, from a customer perspective. Uskash, does that answer your question? You just put in the chat. So there's a, another question. How can we make sure that our jobs are saved from automation and work in a more and work for a more flexible environment in the future? So do you think programming will be such one skill that will be in demand even when robots have taken over most of the jobs by 2030? Yeah, so I think I already answered that question. One is, you know, you be, the workforce will be required to uh, do designs of those algorithms which will get programmed. Uh, and has a lot of work to go into requirements and design of that algorithm, which could then finally gets coded uh, and hence requirement of domain and process. And then you will have a huge army of people just doing analytics uh, around that data to further put into the AI engine saying, now change the rules and you know, do this. So I actually think it's a great story uh, from a human uh, species evolution perspective. Yes, it requires people to be very careful about what choices they're making in uh, upgrading themselves in terms of skill set. And my vote will always be on, uh, you know, either uh, the, the domain process piece of it or the analytics piece of it or just the soft skills piece of it and people engagement piece of it. Um, and maybe programming for a particular language could be the after all those three because it will keep changing. Yeah, I think the world is just evolving and you just don't, you just don't know, like I said, what the direction I've, I've had, I think I had heard Aditya speaking, Aditya Ghosh somewhere, and he was saying that, he said, you know, exactly what I'm saying, like, you just don't know, you know, another five years, it could be an environmental disaster, it could be, you know, anything, and then again, the whole world is going to have to adapt, and then again, you know, everybody's going to have to, you know, change and, you know, adapt to, to that climate, so, you, you just don't know. I have a question here from a student. What, um, what do you think are the, the, least, the least affected industries for automation? Like what, what do you think that there are the industries that automation can touch the least? I think that's what she's trying to say. Well, actually, I see, you know, I actually, uh, you know, the only thing that automation will, uh, you know, I guess touch the least is, you know, your experiences when you, let's say, eat food or when you are, you know, on the beach 
uh, relaxing and traveling. In fact, you won't want technology there actually because you're trying to detox yourself. <laughs> besides those two, and besides playing tennis with human beings, so all leisure, recreational activity kind of businesses, I think, should not get impacted. But uh, everything else will fundamentally will. I was just talking to my dad over the weekend, and he's uh, into various other things, but he's trying to also bring back his agriculture engineering roots. And we were going through certain videos which shows how technology is changing the way people will farm. I mean, there is, you know, poly house farming. You can increase the produce of a blueberry by inducing certain type of music in the greenhouse. I mean, it's crazy. So I think it will impact a lot of things, but it won't impact the very basic things, uh, you know, which provide basic things, the business that provide basic things. Um, we have a question. Uh, any unforgettable experiences with clients that you can share from a decision making or from a management lesson perspective? Oh, I have actually uh, many, but let me just pick uh, one of them. And again, it will it will it will kind of um, triangle with my original thing of it all ends up to people to people. So this was a large deal I was chasing years back, and um, we were in the top two and I asked the customer, I want to win this thing and tell me what I need to do. And uh, he said, you know, nobody's asked me this question before because you're just, just being so upfront. You're in a deal cycle and you're saying, tell me what to do. I said, no, but I want to know, I want to win this. So tell me about your own scorecard. I asked this customer, he was a CFO. I said, tell me about your scorecard. Tell me what will make you successful in the organization. What can I do to help that uh, cause and and build uh, and build this thing with you so that you can you know be more transparent with me in what I need to do to win the deal. And he said a couple of things, and uh, you know he said I would like you know your CEO to come and meet my CEO and do some presentation, and it will help me personally grow in the organization. That hey, I got this big guy coming in. Uh, give me some best practice from other clients. Maybe talk to other people. Just three four things like that. And there are certain small issues happening in some part. Can you get them solved operationally? I did. I did all of those things for him, um, very trivial actually, if you ask me, but it just built that trust with that customer where he felt that I can ask this person for anything and he will get done, even if it's completely outside his limit uh, or his play playground, right? And once that trust is established, then it's easier to do business. It's easier to do deals, it's easier to do operations. It's easier to do anything else. And it, it and this fundamental works even in your personal life. I mean, you know, if your friend trusts you, if your kid trusts you, if your parent trusts you and you have that, then, you know, anything can be driven from both the sides. So fundamentally, the lesson there is try to distill everything down to person to person and see what can be the win-win for that person. And if you're able to solve for that, then I think it goes up to what can you solve for the client and for the organization at large. So... It's actually very simple at the end of the day. So trust and trust and problem solving again and grit. Yeah. You and mentioned grit. Yeah. So you're you have a good relationship with that person, whoever you're interacting with. Sure, sure. Uh, any other questions? Sorry. So we usually have um, we have this series and then we have a career series, um, Puneet. So in the career series, it's interactive with all students. But I guess with this format, I know we wanted to do that. And there's no reason why at some point you can't come back and talk to my um, career students. Um, we have approximately 60 on the soft skill training program. And that is a very interactive session where you actually see my students and then you interact with them. But I guess this was just a different format. So it's really hard looking at all these questions and, and reading them. So students, are there any, any other questions? Please go ahead because we don't have much time. I know Puneet, you have to leave a little early today, right? Yeah. If I can get one last question, that'll be great. Yeah. Let's just see if anybody Usually our sessions run an hour and a half, which um, just because there are that many questions and the, you know, we'll just see if there's any on my phone. But so are there any more questions? Any that you can think, any from the, any from your phone or any, anybody reaching out? Uh, 
Uh, Utsaf, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'll just check if there's any question. Sure. Okay, we have one last question. Um, which, which soft skill before getting a job is the most important you should learn before you should learn during this pandemic pandemic. So which soft skill before getting a job is would you say is the most important one you should learn before uh, during this pandemic? So uh, I'm going to give you a very uh, simple answer because I actually believe in this soft skill. It's underrated because nobody teaches it. Uh, and I think it's required at least in context of Indian culture. And that soft skill is listening. If uh, people can focus on listening uh, as a soft skill and just train their behavior and minds to just listen to whether it's the client, whether it's the employee, whether it's the team, because listening gives you a lot of insights into customer problems, employee problems, and those insights will give you solutions. So uh, rather than be in a hurry to tell people what you want to tell, uh, listen from them uh, and uh, listen to what's being said and listen to what's not being said. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you can analyze the undertone of what the ask is, but the pe people are actually not saying it, right? So, um, and you will see this as people grow in their careers, everybody wants to, you know, uh, relay what they have learned, what they have understood, you know, on, on to people. But I think every opportunity of interaction is a good listening opportunity because then it helps you learn and helps you solve the problem for their customer employee better. So that's the one skill set I would want everybody to hone down on. I'm just trying to think, where can I teach that? <laughs> <laughs> just listen i think uh no it's a, it's a really valid point i've never heard anybody say that you know just, metric, uh, just to sign this off and i actually used to measure my sales people because when i entered my sales meetings you know i felt that um in a customer meeting 90 percent time we were talking and 10 percent time customer was talking uh and now we actually define an outcome of a good sales meeting as a uh, customer talking 80 percent of the time uh, so it's something that can be taught, something that can be measured, and it actually does uh, drive the right outcomes. Sure, sure. We have a couple, I, I know Puneet, you have to go, but uh, maybe one really quick question. Okay. Oh, right. Do you think capital markets in India are still at a, a nascent stage from investment perspective, otherwise seeing India as an emerg emerging economy? Well, I think it's growing. I think it's a it's a growth area for India. Uh, we will see investment markets, you know, uh, doing better and better because, uh, you know, traditionally all of us in our families have only invested in one thing called real estate, which everybody knows is not going anywhere. So even individuals are looking at alternative solutions to invest in different asset classes, um, different markets, even global markets, commodities, funds. So I think. It's a, it will be a great growth area in India and also, you know, with foreign uh, companies buying in and all that stuff. I think it's a, it's a great area to be in. Uh, if you are looking at it from a prospective career perspective, it's a great area to be in a investment uh, banking arm of a big bank in India or, or something like that. Sure. Okay, I didn't realize there were a few questions in the Q&A, but I know you have to go, Puneet. So I'm just thankful that you've been able to devote this much time to us today. And you know what? I, I, I would have you back in a heartbeat to speak to my students. I, I share so many similar views to you. And I just love the way you are so customer focused and customer driven. And it's like always listen to the customer. And, you know, I mean, these are, these are things I cannot teach. You are in the industry. These are things that, coming from you it's just so valuable and you know i i hope you'll you know find some time maybe in the new year to come back and, and talk to my careers team uh the, the kids they're really good students and and it's always such a nice interactive session so thank you today for your time it's been amazing and uh, i know you're busy so i will let you sign off um is dean sir here um but i know that 
he had a meeting. He did want to just say thank you. So I'm not sure if he's on. Everybody, um, we have exams running at the moment. So it's a little uh, busy on, on our side at the moment as well with students and things. Um, Utsaf, if not, then Puneet can please sign off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he's left. Uh, he was here in the beginning. Okay, sure, sure. No problem. Puneet, thank you so much. And you have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Purva. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.